This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. Very happy to be joined this week with an in-studio guest, our own Jonathan Newman. Uh, some of you know Jonathan as a fellow here at the Mises Institute, a recent uh, PhD graduate, so he's now Dr. Newman, uh, one of the first people through the new uh, Auburn PhD program, and also a frequent author and blogger for us. So this weekend, this weekend we are talking science and scientism. Uh, Jonathan wrote an article called Neil Tai, the Scientism Guy, uh, just a couple days ago. And of course, this all comes on the heels of the uh, March for Science, which occurred throughout several U.S. cities last weekend. And also uh, uh, N- Neil DeGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, the science guy, have both been in the news quite a bit lately, uh, the latter with his new Netflix show, uh, ostensibly dealing with science. So it's it's very timely. I enjoyed the article very much. We'll post a link to it. Uh, so let's just kind of go back for a second and talk about this March for Science and, and all these things that are happening. There seems to be uh, sort of a conservative versus liberal battle going on in the country where progressives are sort of implying that uh, conservatives, particularly Christians, are scientific illiterates and that there is objective truth out there as opposed to fake news. And so your article is kind of bound up with what's happening uh, in in the U.S. right now. So talk a little bit about what, what prompted you to write it to begin with. Sure. Well, the, the immediate uh, or direct uh, thing that really uh, triggered me to write this article was a video by Neil deGrasse Tyson. And basically he was just sum, summing up a lot of the things that we that we heard in the uh, March for Science and other other people. But yeah, you're exactly right. So there's this there's this big uh, crowd, there's this big mass of people who who say that if you disagree with like this set of policy, uh, this set of policies, usually on the left hand side, then you're just an idiot. You know, you just don't understand right. the science behind it. As if the science just sort of like gives it gives way to this this set of policy recommendations. Well, you know, you start out talking a little bit about scientism in economics. Uh, some people seem to forget sometimes that economics is a social science and hence uh, not pr- necessarily um, applicable to the same scientific method that we talk about in physical sciences. Um, tell a little bit, tell us a little bit about Mies, what Mises had to say about scientism, especially with respect to econ. Yeah, so this was a big issue for uh, Mises. He he definitely closely guarded the boundary between economics and other sciences. Uh, so uh, Mises' position is methodological dualism, that right. uh, empiricism, the scientific method, uh, doing experiments and making observations is, is, is especially suited for the natural sciences. So, you know, we can go up to the top of a building and drop a rock and, and we can test, you know, how fast it falls to the ground. And we can do that over and over again. And it's very repeatable. And, you know, we can do it as many times as it takes to uh, come up with some sort of general conclusion. But that method doesn't really work for the social sciences. So there's this big categorical difference between the way inanimate objects behave and the way humans behave. So humans obviously have this capacity to make choices. And so there's no way to set up some sort of experiment where you could come up with this general uh, uh, constant relation that has to do with human choices. So that's that was Mises's view. But today in a lot of PhD programs, I mean, there's a, a lot of mathiness, right? There's a lot of uh, emphasis on empiricism and testing of hypotheses. Is it, is it wrong for economists to say, well, I have, I have a theory, I have an economic theory, I'm going to, it's a hypothesis, I'm going to go out and test it. And depending on what I find out empirically, I'll, I'll maybe revise it. Um, uh, e- even Austrians see some benefit in empirical work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're exactly right. So uh, the, the big difference is when we're constructing economic theory, we use logical deduction, or as Mises called it, or the, we go through the logic of action or praxeology, as Mises called it. Um, but there's definitely a place for empiricism, even when we're studying uh, human behavior. But the, the big question is, what counts as economics and what doesn't count as economics? You know, if you're just sort of uh, looking at, you know, how much, uh, how much people spent on McDonald's, uh, during the last year, is that really answering an economic question? Are you constructing economic theory or are you just looking at some sort of historical fact? So th- so the question is, what is economics and what is economics not? <laughs> or what isn't economics? Right. And not necessarily uh, whether or not we should be doing as, as much empirical work as we as we are. 
You know, ordinarily, you see academics sort of guard against mission creep by other fields and specialties into their own. It seems like economists have, have ventured into statistics and, and math and all kinds of data collection without much howling um, from, from some of these, these other fields. But it, I'm sure you've heard the criticism, as I have, that, that uh, Austrians in particular uh, suffer from uh, excessive a prioriism, that they're too focused on uh, deductive truths that we can observe from human nature that don't necessarily need to be tested, and that this hinders you know, Austrian proponents in terms of real-world effectiveness. Yeah, there's there's certainly a level, there's an air of sophistication that comes with, you know, having a big uh, graph behind you when you're giving an academic presentation. <laughs> so a graph with a bunch of numbers, you know, a lot of people say, oh, wow, you know, that's great. So so the Austrians definitely, they don't have that, that air of sophistication when it comes to, you know, these high powered uh, mathematical models. But uh, I mean, the question is, which which is closer to the truth? Are, are we doing economics when we're doing it uh, the praxeological way? Or are we doing economics when we're trying to do it the empirical way? But beyond just methodology and whether something is proper economics or, or, or not proper economics or, you know, perhaps some other field, um, how has scientism infected economics or how has it harmed it maybe? In my opinion, you can use statistics, you can use data to come up with any sort of conclusion that you like. So a lot of times what happens when we're doing economics, uh, we're sort of on the way towards a policy prescription. Maybe that shouldn't be the case, but and when you're using stats, when you're using data, there's there are ways that you can twist it around to you know to get whatever conclusion that you'd like. So in that regard, economics is certainly hard because we're not really doing real science. We're just you know we've got this policy recommendation, and then we torture the data enough until it it tells us what we want it to say. Well, it's interesting. As a little bit of a side, I uh, Walter Block shared with me an, some email exchanges he had with the late Gary Becker, the the Nobel Prize winner, who mm -hmm. had been an advisor to Walter, I guess, on his PhD. And um, he, he had similarly voiced this complaint that Austrians, you know, would, would benefit from more empiricism and more, more mathematical work. Um, so Walter pushed back a little bit and said, you know, at what point would you accept as, as an a priori truth that all other things being equal, raising the minimum wage reduces the demand for lower skilled workers. And so uh, Gary Becker ultimately sort of acknowledged this point by Walter and said, well, with that, I, I, I think I can, I can agree with your a, a priori observation. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we don't have people asking in mathematics, for example, um, do, do we don't continue to empirically test uh, two plus two is four. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I assume no one's empirically testing gravity or certain laws of, of physics or thermodynamics. Yeah, or the I mean, example of my article with the Pythagorean theorem. Th th that right. just doesn't happen. But for some reason, everybody thinks that it's okay to try to do that in economics. But, you know, when we get beyond some baseline uh, knowledge in, let's say, physics, and we get to something that's actually very complex, like uh, the fluctuations in the Earth's temperature over millennia, um, you know, th then we start to talk about settled science and, and politics comes into it and we start to get beat over the head uh, by the uh, Bill Nye's of the world. So talk a little bit how about how you discuss in the article how politics plays a role in politicizing science. Well, I, I think everybody should sort of uh, – their skepticism should turn up a little bit whenever they hear this term settled science, especially when there's a policy recommendation right after it. Because I go through a few different examples in the article of where even uh, government programs that had the backing of the scientific community and the backing of, you know, settled science, they had to backtrack. They, they went back on uh, what they originally started doing. So I go through the example with uh, DDT, which mm -hmm. was controversial with some of the commenters, and with the, uh, the food pyramid and a lot of the nutritional stuff. And also, uh, since we just celebrated Earth Day, uh, uh, there were many different um, – predictions that were made in 1970 that turned out to be just totally wrong. And so there, right. there are plenty of times where we've seen the scientific community uh, has some sort of some co some conclusion and then the government enacts some policy based on that conclusion and then everything has to be – has to go backwards. Right. And everything has to be overturned. Right. But it seems to me there's an inherent contradiction. There, there's a hypocrisy in saying that the scientific method is the way to go. Things are testable, verifiable, falsifiable, and then also saying, well, this is settled because mm -hmm. if, if, if the scientific method applies, then new data can always come into play. Right, exactly. Um, you know, the thing that worries me, Jonathan, is 
this isn't just in, in necessarily in public policy. It's also in, unfortunately, what we have to call public health, which is there's a lot of government-funded research that goes on out there. And the Bill Nye's of the world would have more of it and it less private funding, presumably. Um, does it concern you that that uh, government funding, and then you start talking about settled science, that it sort of narrows and mainstreams uh, um, research. In other words, if if you have a, a really off-the-wall idea about cancer, um, you're probably not going to get funded by NIH or at your university. So it, it tends to uh, maybe limit scientific advancement rather than furthering it. Yeah, you're right. So it'll limit it. And also there's a question of whether it'll bias the results. So a lot of times if some, if there's a lot of money on the line uh, to get some sort of result, then the researchers who were doing the the science might be more inclined to get that result that they're being paid to find. And so obviously when there's a lot of money on the line and when there's a, a lot at stake uh, politically, then, then, you know, scientists might be more inclined to to you know, fudge the numbers a little bit, or you mm-hmm. know, they'll they'll torture the data until it, it gives them the result that they want, just so that they can please the people who are paying them. So there's that. Yeah, it's going to limit the amount of science that's done, but also that's there's a chance that will bias the the science as well. You know, Jonathan, what amazes me is that so much of what we see in social sciences is really decidedly unscientific, right? If you look at sociology or women's studies or f- feminist studies or, or e- you know, e- even history, y- you'll often find that uh, far from an objective uh, framework or perspective, there's sort of some uh, preferred results mm-hmm. uh, and, and the scientific uh, research, the, the uh, peer-reviewed uh, uh, articles all sort of try to reach that result. It's, it's conclusory rather than truly scientific. Yeah, exactly. So the, the way science ought to be done is that you have some hypothesis that you're trying to test. And so you, you proceed forward that direction. But a lot of times what happens in, in some of these social sciences, like you mentioned, but also even in the natural sciences, the, there's a conclusion first, and then you're trying to get to that conclusion so that you can add your name to the list of scientists who have who have the same conclusion as everybody else. But, but how do we reach that? I, I mean, you've, you've recently earned a PhD, so you've been through quite a bit of, of higher education at Auburn, which is, is not a, a left-wing bastion, but not a right-wing bastion either. Um, you know, talk about some of the ways that this that you saw this. How does this seep down into, you know, th- throughout academia? One of my big things is is being careful about the way we make uh, causal claims in our papers. So in my in my dissertation, I did use some empirics. I used uh, some econometrics. I was looking at some old survey data about how uh, reliable um, student responses about their own GPAs were. And so I had to be, I was very careful about the way I, I would make causal claims. So I didn't say that, you know, this, this impacted this because we have this regression that has this sign on this variable. So I think a lot of it comes down to just being careful of the way we word things and that when we say something causes something else, then we have to be very careful about what's backing that up. Well, Jonathan, what, what concerns me is that you're, we're assuming that scientists and academics are necessarily well-intentioned rather than sort of weaponizing science to use it as a bludgeon against us to, to uh, forward certain public policy prescriptions. And, and you talk about that a little bit here in the end of your article where you say that the end goal of this, these science marches and stuff is bigger government. People like Neil deGrasse Tyson would say, you know, how did we rise up from this sort of backwards country? Well, it's because of government funding and government research and that this is the, the path forward. Um, there seems to be an anti-market uh, bias in the in the march for science. Uh, you're absolutely right. So there's this worldview problem among scientists. And I just got done watching a few episodes of Bill Nye's uh, uh, Netflix show, and you see it there as well. So there's this complete denial of the market being able to produce anything or do anything of value. I think they they had one small segment about you know can we actually go to space with uh, private firms, uh, and but there was this big question, and it, it, I think they ended up with the conclusion that the the private firms are, ha- are going to have to work with governments so that mm. they have the adequate uh, resources to go to space. And so yeah, there's there's this big uh, worldview divide on. In these popular scientists like Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye, where they don't they don't trust the market, they don't they don't see the market at work for for people, they don't see the the benefits of of free markets around the world, and so there's this heavy reliance on on government and on on all of these government interventions to to sort of give them what they want, which is more government funding for their own science. 
Well, it's, it's ironic uh, that the people who are charged with finding objective truth are now apparently joining the chorus of people who are telling us to shut up and stop asking questions. Jonathan, thanks so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.